This is Lisa from This Jungian Life. We're excited to announce the launch of This Jungian Life Learning, an online educational platform that offers a chance to dive into Jungian topics more deeply. Our first offering will be a 12-month program called Dream School. The three of us will guide you in learning how to interpret your dreams so that you can learn the language of the unconscious. Jung said, in each of us there is another whom we do not know. He speaks to us in dreams and tells us how differently he sees us from the way we see ourselves. Learning to work with our dreams can help us hear the perspective of this other, leading to an abiding sense of aliveness, renewed creativity, and greater psychological wholeness. Dream work can help us resolve inner conflicts, shift how we approach interpersonal relationships, and help us to find our authentic ground. We're hoping to launch Dream School later on this summer. If you'd like to be one of the first to hear about it, please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the banner link at the top to sign up for our email newsletter. Thank you. Welcome to this Jungian Life Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Several listeners have asked that we cover the topic of the hero and the hero's journey, and so we decided to do that today. We're going to start by taking a look at the work of Joseph Campbell. He was a mythologist who was very influenced by Jung. He cataloged the stages of the hero's journey across myths from many different times and many different cultures looking at the bones of these stories and the monomyth that they tell. We're also going to look at how hero energy turns up in our lives, how hero energy turns up in the consulting room, and uh, the different ways that it can show up. Joseph Campbell was the engine behind the enlivenment of the hero myth. I think his influence is so far-reaching that we often can't even really hold the scope of it. Campbell uh, was born in about 1904. He he passed away in uh, the late 80s. And uh, people like George Lucas and a number of other Hollywood figures were deeply, deeply influenced by his work, and particularly The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was published in 49. He really, I think, woke the hero myth into conscious dialogue in the Western world in a way that it just hadn't been that explicitly graspable. Mm -hmm. And from the standpoint of synchronicity, it's the late 40s. The world is just coming back together after a terrible World War II devastations. And something in the collective, I would imagine, activates. And someone like Joseph Campbell hears the call, (laughs) which is one of his heroic stages, and he brings forth these ancient myths and puts them into language that the Western world can access and name and claim. And once you know about the hero's journey, you really see it everywhere. I mean, it's in all kinds of myths and fairy tales, and it's in film and books, Sometimes by design, because a lot of screenwriters or novelists will use Campbell's work in order to help draft an arc for their story. But a lot of authors will say they had no idea about it, and yet they write their stories in a way that conforms to this because it's archetypal. Yeah. That's the thing about the hero myth is that it is embedded in each of us in our psychic structure. And I think that uh, Joseph Campbell's work uh, really popularized 
the extent to which we all live in a mythological substrate. He lifted it up and made it conscious. And of course, Jung did uh, very much the same thing. But it is astonishing to realize uh, in today's modern world uh, that we are still all living uh, in these mythological narratives, these life arcs, one way or another. And certainly the hero's journey is deeply human. It goes across cultures and back in time. Um, it is the human story. And the universality of these stages, which we'll talk about in a moment, allowed Campbell to look through comparative mythology and comparative religion and name with great confidence that this is woven into the human soul. It's woven into art, and it's woven into the psychology of being human. And so let's, uh, let's just jump into some of this work, and I think we can perhaps uh, access both literature, and I think it's always fun to look at movies, <laughs> whether it's Star Wars or Harry Potter, or The Matrix, Lord of the Rings, uh, you, you just almost, <laughs> once you see the patterns, like anywhere you turn, mm -hmm. yeah. that this is present. And also, these are all movies that gripped the American imagination. Mm -hmm. And it very well may be because the hero's journey was part of it. Yeah, I, I just want to say on that, I am I am old enough <laughs> <laughs> to have seen Star Wars when it first came out. I think I was like, no, I'm not going to say how old I was, but I, I was uh, the right age to fall in love with it. Let's put it that way. And I was so gripped by it. I was so gripped by it, as was the whole world. And you look back now and like, honestly, the acting is just mostly terrible, you know, <laughs> but it's like, it was not the acting that made that movie so fantastic. It was the story. And it's, and I'm convinced that film was so successful because it just spoke directly to this archetypal experience that we all just implicitly recognize when we see it. I was in high school, late high school when the movie came out. And I still remember sitting there with uh, like 10 of my friends. I was very, very close friend group. And Luke Skywalker is like lift, trying to lift the plane out of the bog. And I remember us all turning to each other and going, oh, the force. <laughs> that was not the first movie, though, right? Isn't that in? I, I'm not one sure which one it was, but it, it, <laughs> but anyway, it somehow it just it grabbed us. It, it populated. I think I us. saw it ten times that oh. summer. Oh my goodness! I remember being gripped by the idea of the force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, isn't that uh, an incredibly Jungian idea? Uh, that something greater than you are will guide you. Runs through us and connects us all. Oh, yes. Yeah. And how disappointing it is in the late Star Wars when you find out they're only midichlorians, microscopic creatures in your blood that give you the force. No way. I didn't know it that. Totally. It totally <laughs> took it from mysticism to like cellular <laughs> biology. Like just how reductive. My, yes. How. <laughs> My inner teenager just crumpled on the floor. So I had no idea of that because I have oh, not kept up with the franchise. It was so painful. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really terrible. It actually sounds like a metaphor for how we treat psyche in our culture. Right, right. <laughs> so here we are at the beginning of the hero's myth. And one of the things that's universal about the hero's myth is it always starts in the ordinary world. And in that mm -hmm. way, it grabs everybody because we're all watching it at the start from our ordinary world. We're sitting there in the theater with our popcorn. Very ordinary. So, you know, in the beginning of Star Wars, you know, Luke has these ideas about, uh, you know, running away, but he has to stay and help his aunt and uncle with the harvest, right? So that's the, the ordinary world and his uncle and aunt kind of chastise him for being too much of a dreamer and he, he just has to do the workaday things. It's so workaday. He actually lives on a moisture farm. 
Like that's actually what they do. Really? I mean, it's so <laughs> reduced. And, and Harry ba- Potter is a boy that lives in a cupboard under the stairs. Yeah, yes. right. In this with this very ordinary muggle family. Oh, absolutely. And in the Matrix, Thomas Anderson is like a citizen and a hacker. He's like he's like a schmo. Just sitting there in like this dormitory style department, plucking away at all hours on a computer. And what could be more ordinary than the Shire? Oh, the, <laughs> exactly. Little Hobbit in the Shire, our friend Frodo, who does not even want to go on the adventure. Well, hobbits don't have adventures. <laughs> and, and also Peter Parker. He's another hero. <laughs> He's a schmo. Oh, yes. He's not only is he a student, he's like a bullied student. Yes. He's you know, he's skinny, no you know, nobody likes him, he doesn't get the girl. So it's it's like really like nothing's going on that anybody would be impressed by at the beginning of the journey. Right. The, these are really wonderful uh, images of Peter Parker as transforms into Spider-Man, but he is nerdy and skinny and a little bit of a wimp. And Clark Kent is kind of a nebbish. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so there is this wonderful promise inherent in the hero's journey that uh, you too can be a hero. Because all these other heroes came from very ordinary stock just like you. Which is, I think, what makes it, it draws us in. You know, we're mm. all schmoes oh, yes. at the beginning. Yep. Who knows where we might wind up? <laughs> the next stage that Campbell uh, tosses out to us is despite our ordinariness or the ordinariness of the character, somehow there is the call to adventure. Right. And in, in Star Wars, it's when Luke is fixing R2-D2 and he stumbles across this recording of Princess Leia and he's immediately bewitched by it. And he knows something here is important and he wants to help her. In The Matrix, Neo receives this cryptic messages that reference The Matrix. In Lord of the Rings, Gandalf tells Frodo that he must be the one to destroy the one ring Mm -hmm. in Spider-Man, this genetically engineered spider bites Peter Parker when he's in a field trip in the laboratory. He he hides it because it's so like embarrassing. There's that great moment in the film where the spider's like on the ceiling and it sees Peter Parker and it just puts down a little thread of silk and nabs him. So something happens and Harry Potter, by the way, gets this letter delivered by an owl. Right. That's, that's right. We love Harry Potter. The call yes. to adventure. Mm-hmm. Gasp. Something unusual has happened. Right. Something unusual happens, and very often uh, the wannabe hero or the future hero doesn't know what to make of it. It seems like it's too much. I don't want to go. What are you talking to me about this for? Hold it. Wait, whoa, wait a minute. Let me think about it. Uh, there's a real too muchness. And and that actually brings us to the next stage. Mm. The refusal of the call. And and it's important to point out, and Campbell makes this point abundantly clear, not every hero's myth or fairy tale or journey has all of these stages. These are just some of the common ones. But yes, the refusal of the call is a very common one, just like you were talking about, Deb. That is in The Hobbit, where Bill says, mm-hmm. oh, I'm not, I'm not going on the adventure. Yeah. Or in Star Wars, it's where Luke says that he can't follow Obi-Wan. He has to go back and help his aunt and uncle with the harvest. No, I can't do that. I don't have time. Yeah. Or Harry doesn't believe that he could be a real wizard. Like, that's just bizarre. Well, and, and in Harry Potter in particular, the refusal of a call partly comes at the behest of Harry's aunt and uncle, mm-hmm. who refuse to let him receive the letters mm-hmm. and try to run away from them because they keep on piling up in the house. That's right. They shoot through the door finally yeah. in this river as the call is being thwarted. And Neo, you know, talks to Trinity finally, kind of meets this underground organization. But at this point, he's questioning whether or not he's just dreaming, that mm-hmm. he, he's just making this stuff up in his mind. Yeah. And, and Peter Parker, who gets nipped by this radioactive spider, you know, he refuses his higher calling and he decides that he's just going to 
get into an underground wrestling ring and make some cash because he's now got these superpowers and he can toss people around. But the, but he is not in touch with anything heroic that's going on. So there's only there's a lot of different ways that people can can not own or disown uh-huh. the fact that something extraordinary is beginning, uh-huh. which seems really reasonable, Deb, as you were saying earlier. Oh, absolutely. It's a real confrontation uh, represented by all these various challenges with the unconscious. Uh, it's what Jung called, uh, you know, the confrontation with the dragon. The first response is sort of like, whoa, well, hold it. Uh, you don't mean me because it's way too big for the ego or for consciousness to be able to see its way through. And so the hero's journey is going to call on something beyond consciousness, something that the ego doesn't totally own or have mastery of. Yeah, the refusal of the call is a little bit like the regressive restoration of the persona that we've talked about before on the podcast, where you just, something has been unsettled about consciousness, and there's a part of us that just wants things to go back the way they were before. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And how many wonderful opportunities are lost in the refusal of the call? We think about the many years we've done analysis and before that in social work, and Either we're, we're there in the consulting room with someone who says, you know, this opportunity just knocked on the door, you know, and I can feel in myself, you know, like, go, run through the door, <laughs> grab go, this, yes. jump on the stallion, run, go across <laughs> the plains, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> half the time, if not more, people are like, nah, <laughs> nah, I've got it yes. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> It's a great idea, man. I'll think about it later. (laughs) So true. So true. I'm sure we each have had moments like that in our own lives where we refused the call. Mm -hmm. And we certainly see it in the people we work with because it's very human. Yes. And it's also easier to see in someone else's life than it is in our own, you know. So sometimes we're right on the edge of the call. And if we're lucky... And if the universe is with us, we meet the mentor. Yes. And of course, in Star Wars, that's when Luke goes and visits with Obi-Wan. Uh, that is in Harry Potter. It's, um, I think, Harry's first mentor is Hagrid. Mm-hmm. Right? They go to Diagon Alley. Diagonally. Mm-hmm. I think she's so <laughs> clever. Diagon Alley. And he gets to purchase his school supplies <laughs> <laughs> Best school shopping shit trip ever absolutely amazing <laughs> and uh and morpheus meets with neo to take uh, the red pill or the blue pill the red pill is are you ready for the truth the blue pill is well, we'll put you to sleep and tuck you back into your old life so the the blue pill is is actually the refusal of the call in a big big way So something comes to meet our unwitting wannabe hero, that help will be there from an unmet friend, uh, unknown source. First, you have to start on the journey. And often the mentor in myths and fairy tales is the archetype of the wise old man, whether that's Dumbledore or Gandalf or um, in... Celtic fairy tales, there's often a kind of wise old man figure. And then there are crones. We have fairy fairy godmothers and Mm -hmm. um, old hags sitting under oak trees. Mm -hmm. But some kind of uh, benign, helpful, protective uh, power that seems aligned with uh, the trajectory, with with destiny, with the future. Mm Mm-hmm. And the mentor often has some, or is assumed to have, some relationship to the self that is perhaps more developed at the given moment than the heroes. And this shows up in the projections that happen in the analytic encounter frequently, that people who want to be on a heroic journey may come into analysis, and initially at least, 
see the analyst as holding the mentor projection. And that can certainly be a role that an analyst can play. And we can hold that for someone until they realize that the mentor is an image of the self that's active in them. So if the mentor is met, you know, Hagrid takes Harry and Harry says, yes, you know, Neo takes the red pill. Luke accepts the lightsaber. Well, when his aunt and uncle get killed, he's like, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm good. Yeah. Out. yeah. Well, that's, I think the next threshold. And, uh, uncle Ben advises Peter Parker that he has to take responsibility for these magical powers. And uncle Ben becomes something of the mentor, the ethical mentor. And if that's grasped, and then we have the crossing of the first threshold. Right. And now we've left the ordinary world. Mm -hmm. Now we're at Hogwarts and all kinds of <laughs> crazy stuff is going on. And Harry's eyes are big as saucers, as are all of ours. Yeah. The threshold can be marvelous. It can also be painful in as much as it demands an accommodation to a larger reality, which has always been there. But somehow, whether it's the infantile defenses or the culture itself, has buffered us, and we we just didn't catch a glimpse of it before. I always think of it, and I love the images of Harry Potter and, and showing up at Hogwarts, of here I am in a whole new world. Mm -hmm. I yeah. am in a realm that is completely different and totally unknown, and I have to make my way. Mm -hmm. I think that is uh, such a human situation uh, that we see all the time of being in the unknown, being in the don't know. The old rules don't apply, and I don't know what the new rules are. And there's the opportunity here for great danger and fear, but yes. we also sense that there's the opportunity for great uh, wonderment and transformation and really something fantastic as well. And in more ancient tales, the crossing the threshold was bone chilling. I mean, one crossing, the first crossing of the threshold, I think, in Harry is that he learns that his parents were killed by Voldemort. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it, I mean, that's a moment of, of horror. Mm -hmm. uh, Neo actually takes the red pill, and in that horrifying scene where he wakes up mm -hmm. in this pod and this slime, you know, drains out and these cords pop off of his body uh, and he's like gasping and gagging that the first threshold is, is, is kind of stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Parker's uncle is murdered. The beloved uncle that raised him. Mm. Peter has this moment where he's going to become a murderous avenger of his uncle's killer, or he's going to embody uncle Ben's, morals mm. decide that he's going to be a force for good in the world. But there is a real piercing of innocence, isn't there? And delusion. Yeah, yeah. illusion of, of this is it uh, for Harry Potter. This is what happened to my parents. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's a stark revelation of a dark reality. That challenges you to take responsibility. Yes. Again, these are, these all don't. It's not like they all fit this clearly. But I mean, I think in Lord of the Rings, it's like when when they put the ring in the fire and it's confirmed that this is the one ring. It's horrifying to think that there's this object of such great power that could be so devastating, and and that it's fallen to Frodo to be responsible for it. That is a kind of crossing of the threshold. Absolutely. And that they all realize that the only place to get rid of this is Mount Doom. You know, that this is this is a life-threatening response yeah. um, to what they've learned. So it takes the ability to confront fear. I mean, do you want to go climb Mount Doom? I don't. Thanks, but no thanks. It is a scary danger-filled journey that does threaten to be sort of too much. And we, we have to face fear, uh, sometimes 
We have to face uh, laziness or lethargy, such as when Odysseus was in the land of the opium eaters. Uh, and we have to um, overcome our regressive longings for uh, that nice, easy life back on the farm or back in the Shire. Yeah. And I mean, I think, Deb, a lot of what you're you're saying relates actually to the, the next stage. Hmm. Which is tests, allies, and enemies, which is really kind of like in a, in a Greek drama. You know, we're kind of really getting all the characters together and the and the action is now you know in full bloom right this is the part in the movie i think this is this is probably the bulk of most of these movies it's it's all of the kind of adventures in between it's uh for the lord of the rings it's all of their journeying across middle earth to get to uh mordor right and and particularly you know facing the balrog you know the first horrifying enemy and then Galda, Gandalf getting dragged into the pit. I mean, oh. both of those are such tests to lose the mentor or that version of the mentor mm-hmm. uh, is, is a terrifying kind of moment. Right. Morpheus finally tr- starts training Neo to fulfill his role as the one who will free humanity. You know, Morpheus um, is, you know, the ally along with the entire team, and he is in this testing and training, and the enemies are being identified in the Matrix. For Harry, I think it's a softer moment. I think, you know, that's him adjusting to life at Hogwarts, that he's he's identified Ron and Hermione as his allies. Yeah, but he has to deal with Snape, and he has to deal with, uh, yeah. the, um, you know, he's learning Quidditch, and he has to deal with Malfoy. So there are lots of tests. Enemies. Mm-hmm, and enemies and allies. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not a small thing. And then Han Solo and Chewbacca, mm-hmm. you know, show up as the allies. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, we'll take you. We'll take yeah. you on the trip. Yeah. And I'm thinking uh, psychologically uh, that there are parts of the psyche that are imaged as allies, friends, uh, and more. And that the enemies, uh, from an internal point of view, are regressive or infantile or uh, illusory ideas about reality. And that that, in, in this part of the hero's journey, the trials, tests, and tribulations, is what we're really fighting, are these outwardly manifested images of inner dynamics that need to be overcome, confronted. And, and the heroic attitude is that which gives us the energy to confront these things, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I always think about the idea that we need allies, Mm-hmm. It's very rare for the hero to wake up and do the entire journey alone, whether it's fairy tales or myths or these modern tellings of stories. We need assistance on the hero's journey. The next stage that Campbell offers to us is the approach to the inmost cave. <laughs> So, you know, with Neo, it might be that, you know, the Oracle meets with Neo Mm -hmm. and tells him that either he or Morpheus will die Mm. and that Neo has the power to choose who that will be. Joseph, you remember this film far too well. Um, I loved that movie. (laughs) I did too, but I don't remember it that well. Um, I think I think in Lord of the Rings approach at the inmost cave we might think of it actually as the confrontation with the Balrog. Mm. That's where I would put that. Okay. Uh, where Gandalf gets, you know, allegedly killed. Or uh, Jonah being in the belly of the whale. Mhm. Of uh-oh. Now what? Here I am. Mhm. Uh so it's a going inward of uh, the place of darkness, the unconscious. Like I would say, as the approach, it might be when they're standing, they're trying to get into the minds of Moria. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And then there's like this, there is this horrible monster in the mm-hmm. water. Right. And, you know, Gandalf is saying, I would not go there if I had another choice. Yes, but they yes. can't get through the pass. So, you know, the cave opens up and they're like, oh, crap. Yeah, it's literally. You know, we're going to have to go through the minds of Moria. 
in Star Wars, this would be when their ship is captured by the Death Star and the group mm -hmm. finds itself like inside the Death Star, right? Mm -hmm. This is approaching, yeah. approaching the, the inmost cave. We're coming into the horrible place. I think of uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione that um, they're planning to get the Philosopher's Stone before Snape does. Yes. You no, know, that's just at the beginning of the dark place they're going to jump into. And and there is this, they, they do go beyond this doorway and they find, I think his name is Fluffy, the three-headed dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm also thinking with uh, Spider-Man. You know, S uh, Spider Man is uh, meets the Green Goblin, which is mm. his best friend's father, who's secretly like this arch nemesis. And the Green Goblin, you know, asks, you know, Spider Man to join him in mm. these nefarious adventures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like the opening of a chasm mm -hmm. that he might fall into, and Peter refuses. But it's like right at the opening of something that's going to become really an ordeal, really awful. So, so it's the worst possible thing. It is yeah. the prospect of annihilation. Yeah, it's the thing you've been avoiding the whole time. It's the last thing you want. That inmost cave is uh, the, the biggest, deepest, most overwhelming force and fear. And we have to go there. Exactly. And so you're like at the opening of the cave. You can hear the dragon, let's say, breathing somewhere in the back of the cave. And, <laughs> <"What?"> <laughs> and the next stage is the ordeal, which is right. if you're on the hero's journey, you go into the cave, metaphorically or literally. Right. You face the worst fear. You do. And, and so I think you're right, Joseph. I think the ordeal at this point in Lord of the Rings, that would be the meeting with the Balrog. Yeah, That's especially for Gandalf on his mm -hmm. heroic journey. Mm -hmm. There's so many wonderful subplots yeah. you know, for Gandalf. That's the great trial of his life. Yes. And he smote his ruin upon the mountain. <laughs> God, <laughs> Joseph, you're such a geek. It's so I'm great. Such a geek. <laughs> so I'm, I'm living between it. the worlds. <laughs> so the ordeal, and of course, there's many examples, but here, you know, Neo's group is ambushed by the agents in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. You know, this death-dealing dragon, so to speak, that is absolutely determined to kill them, mm -hmm. is doing everything they can to kill them. And the audience absolutely knows, you know, in this version, what the monster is yeah. in the cave of the Matrix that they have entered. What's the ordeal? What would we say the ordeal would be in Harry Potter? In Harry Potter, it might be. Just that Harry and Ron and Hermione have all kinds of obstacles to overcome, um, to set up and protect the Philosopher's Stone. So I think what's difficult in Harry Potter is that there's so many, a host of just things that they've kind of had to overcome. In uh, I think in Star Wars, it's a little more clear because Darth Vader arrives finally. Mm -hmm. And so there's no question about who the monster is going to be. Well, and, and I think also the ordeal maybe in Star Wars is when they're trying to rescue Princess Leia and they get, they get caught. Mm -hmm. and Darth Vader kills Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a massive loss, uh, a massive ordeal for everyone in the group. I'm finding myself thinking about with all of these various heroes, what are the psychological qualities that it takes to slay whatever form the monster of darkness may take in various uh, tales. And the one that stands out for me, and maybe this is my own wishful thinking to some extent, is that it takes purpose. It takes being devoted to engaged in uh, something greater. Uh, Luke is not just in it for himself and uh, his own aggrandizement. He's, he's caught up in a cause bigger than he is. Uh, and so is Frodo in the whole ring cycle. So is Peter Parker as Spider-Man. He wants to do good. That we, it's that first introduction to being in service to something greater that Jung would call the self, mm, mm -hmm. of acknowledging in some way, this isn't just about me. Mm -hmm. 
I think that that often happens in the reflection after the ordeal that when 9-11 is happening, you're just fighting for your life, right? You're just facing all of the terribleness that's in front of you and accessing anything that you have in you to get through the ordeal. But as you said, Deb, it's after that, you know, what does it mean to have come through this and how am I different? You know, I would say both um, yeah. because you've really touched on something with the reference to 9-11 as I was in New York and I heard stories about uh, people in stairwells and that someone grabbed me and basically dragged me along. Uh, so it may be that sort of unconscious and reflexive acknowledgement in an unconscious way of being in service to something greater followed after the ordeal is over by the reflective meaning making. But I think it operates um, almost uh, reflexively at times and that we have an, an instinct, it's archetypal to see something and be in service to something in the moment. In Lord of the Rings, uh I think uh, one of the big ordeals that's faced by um, Frodo is that Gollum seduces Frodo away from Sam and tricks him to go into Shalab's lair. He gets you know, poisoned and wrapped in the cocoon, and eventually Sam saves him. But that's the first like enormous mm -hmm. ordeal, and, yes. and that he really is almost brought to the brink of death and just barely revived. And in Harry Potter, there's the the whole sequence at the end when the three of them go into, I don't know how to describe it, but almost like this kind of basement part of Hogwarts. And there, there are all these trials. They have to kind of solve all these puzzles and play the chess game to get right up to the end where the Philosopher's Stone is. And then Harry has the confrontation with Voldemort. Absolutely. That's a beautiful example. And the next stage in the sequence that Kemba gives us is the reward. And there are often many rewards because ordeals and rewards, if it's a long story, you know, bounce back and forth. There's an ordeal, they achieve something, and it's stage one of the movie. And then there's another ordeal and a reward, and people keep moving forward. Yeah, it's like a it's like video games, right? They're often exactly. the same arc. Another level. So we might say, you know, just Harry entering the room where the Philosopher's Stone is hidden. I mean, they've gone through this incredible process and they're finally in reach of this desired, desired thing. Frodo is corrupted by the ring's power and no longer wants to destroy it, can be perceived as a reward. He's finally full of all of this inflated, you know, he starts feeling like he's going to be you know, Sauron himself. In myths and fairy tales, oftentimes the reward is the princess or the sword or the jewel or the water of life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can be very positive. Uh, in Spider-Man, Peter Parker saves Mary Jane, which is an enormous reward. Uh, and he also learns that the Green Goblin is his best friend's father. So this incredible like resolution of mystery is a kind of reward. One of the rewards possibly in the Matrix is that Neo blames himself for Morpheus's capture and then decides it's the reward is the clarification of who he is as he re-enters into the Matrix and saves him. That he claims his role as this messianic fated person. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's that Luke decides to join the rebels and destroy the Death Star. That the reward is is each of them know who they are. There's a wholeness and a consciousness that has been attained that can manifest in any one of a number of ways. Uh, but we see it in that sense of self that the hero now ha has earned that they know themselves to be heroes, which then okay. gives them permission to act in non-ordinary ways or to even access capacities that 
they could never have imagined when they were living under the cupboard, Mm -hmm. you know, in the house or just being a hacker in your little room. They have been enlarged and they take responsibility for this larger conscious self that can make choices and has power. And they are in relationship to the ordeal. Mm -hmm. And the ordeal is this terrible thing. And in some senses, the reward is I will rise to this occasion now that I know what this world really is about and that I am called to somehow address this in whatever way is possible. So there's this enlargement and consciousness, but without inflation in a true hero. And stories also have examples of the would-be hero who becomes inflated uh, and and meets with a dire end, usually. Uh, The great example of that is Icarus, who's given his wings to escape prison, and his father, Daedalus, uh, tells him not to fly too high, but Icarus becomes inflated, the wax melts, and he falls to the earth and dies. He can't engage his mentor. Mm-hmm. His father in that moment is his mentor and is, if he could accept the coaching of the mentor, he might have become a winged hero. Yes. We have three more stages, at least so Campbell tells us, the road back, the resurrection, and the return with the elixir. So the heroes claim themselves. Now they're on the road back. So this is the return to the ordinary world. This is the integration of what was learned through surviving the ordeal. This is bringing it back to ordinary life. And so literally in the Lord of the Rings, there is a road back, right? They, the return journey home. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of Gollum biting Frodo's finger off and jumping after the ring to his death as one possibility. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking at Norman's funeral. Harry, Peter's best friend, swears to avenge his father's death. I'm thinking about that before Neo can leave the Matrix again, um, Agent Smith kills him. I'm thinking of Luke refusing Han Solo's offer to leave and choosing to help overcome the Galactic Empire. And Harry facing Professor Quirrell, who's been hosting Voldemort in his body. Mm-hmm. That the road back, again, is, the, is a journey. It's not an arrival. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, it's a bit of a peripatia yes. in the story where there's a shift now and what's required in the dramatic event, which are all, you know, very shocking Mm -hmm. losses. They're instrumental at moving the hero back towards some kind of a starting point Mm -hmm. and, and can still be in the excruciating process of the hero's journey which is leading to what Campbell thinks of as a resurrection, which can be a resurrection literally of the body. Or it could be, for example, in the final battle, Luke hears Obi-Wan's voice. Use the force, Luke. That's a kind Mm -hmm. of resurrection. Or when Gandalf makes his reappearance in the middle of the two towers. Mm -hmm. Harry wakes up in the hospital and he has survived. Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore explains that Harry is protected by his mother's love Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. there is a magic that is older than Voldemort's magic, which is what saved him. Yeah. Um, Trinity tells Neo that she loves him Mm. in that moment in the matrix. She says, I know you are the one because the Oracle told me that I would fall in love with the one and I am in love with you. Mm. And that, revives Neo. Remember, he's been riddled with bullets. He's sitting in the Nebuchadnezzar ship. Um, His brainwaves have gone blank. And anyone else, that would have been the way to you'd pull the plug. But Trinity comes over and whispers to him and kisses him. It's a wonderful fairy tale Mm -hmm, mm moment. Yeah. And then his brain activity returns. And having been resurrected, 
he has this capacity to finally kill Agent Smith. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that uh, Sauron is defeated. The resurrection of throwing, you know, the ring falls in the lava. Mount Doom explodes. That great scene where the eye of Sauron starts swelling back and forth and the ground collapses underneath Mm -hmm. all of the armies. And in that moment, they're dying on this boulder as lava is around them. And the, the eagles come and just barely pick them up with their talons. You know, as they're fainting and being carried off. Mm-hmm. And finally, the return with the elixir. So the hero comes back to the ordinary world with a boon that can be shared with the rest of the culture and the rest of the society. So whether it's that, you know, Neo now has the powers that he needs to defeat the dark forces or that Harry's fate as the one who will challenge he who shall not be named is revealed uh, in in Star Wars, the evil empire has been destroyed, at least momentarily. Um, the Death Star has been destroyed. These are all these moments of the return of the elixir. And sometimes they're very ordinary, and the elixir is a secret inside of them. Mm-hmm. You know, the return for Harry is he goes back to four pivot uh, privet drive for the summer. Mm-hmm. Basically, he's living under the stairways again. Yeah, you know, like that—that's the end of the hero's journey. But there is an elixir of life, yes. a secret in him that no one else in that household can see, but he is absolutely different. Yeah. There is, again, uh, that theme of having been in service to something greater, and that the elixir is, you know, basically uh, having taken an individuation journey. Uh, You may be back where you once began, back in the Shire, or back under the stairs in your little closet, but you are more, and you have more to share with others. There is a redemptive quality here in bringing back the treasure, the the princess, the magic sword, uh, the water of life. Uh, It has an effect um, on the collective. And, you know, I'm thinking about how Jung's life can follow the hero's journey arc. You know, here there he was in the ordinary world, living at 228 C. Strasse. And then he experienced uh, this call to adventure and meeting of the mentor, maybe at, in one, in, all in the same package by meeting Freud. And uh, he goes on an incredible journey, but he he has to um, approach the inmost cave and suffer the ordeal when he had his confrontation with the unconscious. And there were allies and enemies in the inner world that he had to conquer. And then he returned from that ordeal with the elixir. Mm-hmm. The elixir was his incredible psychology, which he shared with the world over the course of the rest of his life. And the return to the world returned him to his ordinariness with the elixir. Yes. He still had to get up every morning. He had, you know, breakfast with his kids who were still young. He had to negotiate with all of the personalities around him that his ordinary life and its obligations mm-hmm. are still there. Yeah. And that's the an important part of the hero's journey because the hero doesn't get to live in an exalted state. Mm-hmm. you know, in their suburban ranch, mm-hmm. you know, talking to their neighbors about it, that you go back to the Shire and you go back to living under the stairs. Frodo goes back to the Shire only because he has this great traumatized experience. He leaves Middle Earth and has to go and live in the Grey Havens with the elves because he can no longer tolerate his wound and and sitting among the happy people Mm-hmm. It's a very sobering, sad. Yeah, well, it, I think I think it shows us that the hero has been changed, and he has something to give to the culture. But he is he is no he is both ordinary and extraordinary at the same time. I, I feel like we're making that transition into talking about what this is like in an actual lived life. Yeah, right. 
Before we go there, and I'm so appreciating you relating this to Jung's life, Lisa, I want to read something from James Hollis's book, Mythologems. The hero task is apparent in the humblest of lives, especially in those who rise wearily and go off to demeaning labor to support their families. It is seen in the willingness of any person to sacrifice creature comforts, narcissistic interests, personal agendas on behalf of a larger value. We do not customarily accord these persons hero status, but their acts renew the world each day, redeem it even, as a place of enduring value. It's such a paradox and a a real... um, uh, conjunctio of uh, joining of the opposites. And it's true that we all need to be able to access some hero energy to overcome a difficult task, to push through a fear, to get out of bed in the morning, even when we're feeling depressed or anxious, uh, to muster the courage to do something that we didn't think we could do. And I think in an analysis we, in the beginning, become aware of our resistances to change in all the ways that we are, whether it's fear or indolence or rage or over-identification with being, having been wounded or victimized, or we just tell ourselves, oh, you know, I've lived in this marriage for so long, who cares? Or, you know, I can just stay in this job that's killing me for another 10 years. You know, the, all of that has to come into this very intense focus and something inside of us needs to face, face the problem. So I'm going to also go to uh, Hollis writing on the hero in his book, Mythologems. He says, we can see that the personal hero task, the task of becoming whomever the gods intended, not what the ego desires, benefits the culture ultimately through providing it with more differentiated values, more unique contributions to the collective. So in some sense, Hollis is saying the hero task is to become whom we were meant to be. And he says earlier in that same chapter that the hero mythologem is a personification of the energy necessary to serve life's transpersonal agenda, especially its developmental sequences. We are brought here, and every cell in our body knows this, to become, to flower, to flourish. We need the hero energy to to do that flourishing because sometimes it's just easier to stay safe and stay small. And when we're gifted with that vision of possibility of flourishing, I think in a very personal way, it can show up as a commitment to change. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't know how to do it yet, but we, we have this sense that somewhere things can be different. And I'm certain that somewhere, somehow it can be different. Mm -hmm. And Jim's vision can trigger that, help us with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, if you're working with someone maybe who is agoraphobic and uh, it's very safe to stay inside, but he recognizes that his life has gotten very small and that he needs to do something that he's very, very frightened to do in order to enlarge his life so that he can serve, as Jim calls it, his transpersonal agenda. He can, he can flower. He can flourish. You do have to call up that inner hero to, to get out of the house sometimes. And using that as an example, after the commitment to change, the hero has to experiment with new conditions or uh, I love Jordan Peterson uses this term that I've adopted, micro experiments. Mm -hmm. I like that. That the person that say is agoraphobic in their commitment, they have to experiment with getting close to the door, putting their hand on the door handle, turning the door handle, feeling like they're going to faint and being their commitment, bringing them back to the door handle and opening it a crack. I mean, for some people who don't suffer from this, this may seem strange, but these are very real, very real trials. Yeah, so we're sort of saying that heroic energy is needed to overcome a neurosis. Yeah. And it takes action. I mean, that's the other part of the hero's journey is it is full of action that the hero isn't theorizing their journey. Yes. 
They're taking a journey. It's really a demand to get out into life. Yes, uh, of doing it first and having some kind of faith uh, that you will be able to figure it out. Uh, and even if you don't have the faith, um, there you are. That scene of uh, Bilbo uh, leaving the Shire, we start on the journey. We don't have a map. There's no game plan. It is about doing and daring to do. And and of course, in our culture, we have people who kind of live out hero archetypes, right? I'm thinking mm-hmm. of firemen mm-hmm. or a lot of recent, there's been a lot of recent talk about, you know, the doctors who are on the front lines working with COVID patients are heroic. And I think that's absolutely true. And I am thinking about people like uh, grandmothers who raise grandchildren, who provide snacks for uh, the kids across the street. There are very ordinary acts of being in service to something greater that, in my view, are heroic. Yes, that's in each one of us. But I I want to suggest that while that's an inspiring image of somebody providing care where there is no care, what makes that, let's say, more of a heroic journey than, let's say, a maternal archetype, is that the person would have to overcome something in them in order to bring that forward. That as they approach, let's say, feeding all their grandchildren or even feeding the kids in the neighborhood that, that, that have no resources, you know, three houses down, is that something inside the person challenges that, tells them perhaps, I don't have enough for my family. How can I possibly be generous to other people? Or, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow? Or there's a feeling of a kind of life and death tension inside of somebody that then must be resolved in order to take the step, which could look ordinary to outside eyes. But inside, something was required to get to that stance, which in fact was new and not familiar. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's such a good point, Joseph. I really wanted to fold into this how important in in the hero's journey, care and generosity uh, can also be. Because in a way, the hero's journey tends to be a kind of traditionally masculine image. And it's imaged in, you know, ways of, of conquering and battling and adventures and enemies. And there is also the other aspect to the hero's journey that has to do with uh, relationship, receptivity, care, generosity. Well, and of course, if we see it as a psychological journey, it it is about mustering a certain kind of energy to have experiences on the inner level Mm -hmm. that might, you know, prepare us to to care for others in the outer world. I'm wondering if if we could talk about some ways in which it might be possible to become over-identified with a heroic attitude. I mean, I think that this can often happen to men in our culture, where they see themselves as the protector, as the fixer, and they, uh, you know, can kind of lose access to their feeling function as a result sometimes. It can be stultifying to become overly identified with the hero archetype, and it can also kind of get you into trouble sometimes. And when I think that happens is what we're seeing is that just a portion of the hero's journey is activated, and then it is iteratively um, repeated, but it does not seem to lead to the enormous transformation of the character, and then the acceptance of the consequences, the new life and the mastery. But for instance, let's say uh, in many of the young military men I've worked with, that the idea of you know overcoming fear preparing to experiment with the conditions of warfare, preparing to go into battle, that those stages seem iteratively exciting. I'm preparing to be a warrior. I'm stronger. I'm more muscular. I'm faster. I'm fierce. I'm sexy. I'm a 
I'm a stallion, I'm, you know, potent. And that can go on for a very, very long time, even in deployment. But it's often when they have an encounter like an IED exploding too close to them, which they survive, that then it's right there where life and death is concentrated, or they witness something like that happen, that then they're in the nadir Mm -hmm. of the hero's journey. But if that doesn't happen either psychologically or in the storyline, often they're just left at the beginning, swinging back and forth. Right. And then I think being identified with the hero can become, it's defensive, really. It, it may be overly extroverted and kind of acted out, out in the world and, and actually used as a way to avoid collapsing into feelings or inner experience. You know, we have another parallel here uh, in Jung's life that uh, in midlife, uh, he had had a dream of Siegfried, uh, the classic German hero with whom Jung had had quite a strong uh, identification. And uh, in his dream, he hears Siegfried coming, he hears his horn, and he knows that he, the dream ego, Jung, has to kill this heroic image. And that is what they did. And when Jung awoke, he was stricken. He was. He said he was filled with disgust and remorse uh, for having destroyed something so great and beautiful. And something in him said, you have to understand this dream and you have to understand it immediately. And he did so. And he said he realized that the attitude embodied by Siegfried the hero no longer suited him and therefore had to be killed. And he experienced the grief over having had to sacrifice his ideal and his heroic uh, stance. And he moved into a very different and new stage of life, of uh, the ending of the ego identification with the archetype of the hero. That's a great story, Deb. I'm thinking of another story he tells in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, where he had had this descent into the unconscious on a very personal level. And there was one critical night where he was laying in bed, knowing there was a pistol in his bedstand, and feeling in such unbelievable anguish. And he said, if this, if this thing does not yield to me, I'm going to end my life. There, there something has to be revealed which is in that nadir, the big change with the feeling of life and death. And he was able to wake the next morning with a dream and a resolution Mm. that allowed him to pass through that hero's journey and move towards a new level of acceptance and a a new sense of himself. And we may have many of those nadirs, whether it's killing Siegfried and feeling like that's the absolute bottom. I couldn't imagine ever doing that in the mythic world. Or this moment of anguish in his life as he's contemplating suicide. And we have those moments too. Yeah. I, I thought I wanted would like to shift into talking about what it's like when identifying with a heroic attitude can become an inflation and there can be hubris. I mean, I'm thinking about what happens to psychotherapists. I mean, I know it's certainly happened to me where I can get hubristic and think, ah, I am the best therapist to help this person. I can get identified with my role as a heroic helper. And it usually doesn't actually help the person when I'm in that place. But I think most of us can probably relate to having been there once or twice. I can. (laughs) Joseph, do you have something you'd like to share? Well, it's a little embarrassing or a lot embarrassing, but when we were prepping this, I I was thinking of a a particular moment in my youth. I had uh, just been hired at a hospital, medical hospital, to be a medical social worker. And, uh, you know, I was really pleased for the opportunity. I felt really welcomed. I felt, you know, like I was wearing really big boots. So it's the first day on the job, and I'm up in the uh, intensive care unit. I worked in the burn and trauma 
and the neuro neurological ICU. So it was very intense. Uh, it's literally your first day on the job. First day on the oh job. And I walk into the ICU and there's a deputy standing at the front of someone's room and inside is a young man who had been involved in a crime. Um, they had not arrested him yet, but they were monitoring him. And the idea was once he recovers, they're going to charge him and take him to prison. But at this point, the sense is he's going to pass. And his family is standing outside the door, weeping and begging to enter the room. And this very righteous um, officer is at the door saying they absolutely are not permitted in the room. And so my inner hero got really, really big, really, really hot. And I'm standing there facing off with this armed officer, telling him, I'm shouting at him, what you're doing is against the law. You have absolutely no right to do this. You have not arrested this man. He is not under the auspices of your deputy's office. And the guy's coming back to me and he's getting louder. We're both getting louder. People are beginning to like move away from us <laughs> because they're not sure what is going to happen. And uh, finally, what's clear is that he is not going to change and he is either going to attack me or arrest me in that moment. Uh, and finally, something like an inner mentor, like clicks in in the back of my head and says, Joseph, I think you should back off. <laughs> <laughs> so thank God I just got quiet and backed away. Now, in my inflated state, I was sure that I was going to go and pound the desk on an administrator's office and, you know, activate uh, something to, you know, get this guy you know, a real lesson. So I went down and, you know, talked to the powers that be about this. The head of security for the hospital comes in and says, you were 20 seconds from having your ass thrown on the ground and handcuffs put on your back. So there was a little self-preservation, but I have to say in my own defense, the next day that guy was gone. They had a female officer there who was very, very warm and welcoming. And they let that family come to that bedside and care for that dying, mm -hmm. their dying son, regardless of the circumstances that brought him there. So something did come out of it, but I was feeling much more powerful than the situation mm -hmm. really would have permitted me to assume. It's a great story to examine. What I like about it especially is how the mentor can come in and say, stand down that a strategic retreat is also part of the hero's journey. And it can provide a course correction for when, even in the service of something that was clearly uh, human and, and justice oriented, uh, we can still get carried away. We can be possessed by the hero mm -hmm. archetype. And we don't have, uh, we need a, a different perspective that's, that an inner voice, a mentor can provide. Mm -hmm. It's Gandalf sitting there, hanging on the edge of the chasm and looks at Frodo and says, fly, you fools. <laughs> fly. <laughs> Great. So something inside of me said, run away, Joseph. <laughs> you know, I'm aware how much this episode has really been talking about the male psyche. And obviously, women can have heroic energy as well. I just want to comment briefly about how I see that looking in terms of myths and fairy tales. So there are many myths and fairy tales that deal with a kind of female initiation into a heroic stance. And I'm thinking of the myth of Inanna and her journey into the underworld to visit her sister Ereshkigal, or even Persephone's descent into Hades. And, and then for me, I think uh, those two stories are further elucidated by my favorite fairy tale, Vasilisa, the beautiful a Russian fairy tale. And I, I know I've talked about this fairy tale before on the podcast, so I'm just going to move through it really quickly. But basically, she's a very sweet, <laughs> lovely person uh, who is sent by her evil stepmother to go visit Baba Yaga. And Baba Yaga is this terrible, frightening witch who eats people. And uh, she lives on this hut on chicken legs. And the fence around her house is made out of human bones with skulls on top. And the skull's eyes light up when it starts to get dark. Baba Yaga is clearly kind of a degraded image of a 
powerful nature goddess. Anyway, Vasilisa goes and uh, instead of eating her immediately, Baba Yaga tells her, well, you know, you can you can do some things for me and then we'll see. So Vasilisa basically becomes apprenticed to this great dark goddess. And at the end, uh, she receives a boon. She re- she goes into the uh, the inmost cave, which is Baba Yaga's hut. And she survives the trials. And the boon she receives is a skull with lighted eyes that she takes back to her stepmother who had asked her to go to Baba Yaga to retrieve a light because all the lights, the fires had gone out in the cottage. So she gets back to her house and uh, enters with the lighted skull. And then the eyes really light up and they kind of beam jets of fire at the stepmother and the wicked stepsisters and they burn her. So for me, this is an image of uh, the heroine coming back from her ordeal with the boon of uh, intact aggression that she has ready access to. And of course, if you know the Inanna myth, what she return when she returns to the above world. Inanna is kind of like a, almost like an Aphrodite kind of goddess. She's beautiful. At the end of her story, she now has, interestingly, the eyes of death, just like, just like Vasilisa, the eyes of death. She can look at someone and kill them. Mm -hmm. So she has ready access to her aggressive capacity. And I think that that is often the arc of the heroine's story that what she gains is access to her aggression. What the hero often gains because he, a lot of times the boon is the princess is he gains access to his feeling function. I think it's so important to bring this to life in every psyche. And what you've done there is really beautiful. I also just wanted to lift up Lisa, that my impression of your upcoming published book that talks about the transformations of motherhood, to me, rings like a heroic journey as well. Yes, I I think you're right. (laughs) And I discuss that a little bit in the book. Yeah, I mean, this kind of starting in an ordinary place, being put through these tremendous tests, which at times can feel life and death, and then coming out of it transformed and yet returned to the ordinary life of being a mom, Mm -hmm. and having a tremendous internal access. That is a good overview of the book, Joseph. Thank you very much. But I'm wondering, um, not to invite you to uh, bring forward any spoilers, but I'm wondering if you could just spend a minute to talk about motherhood as a heroic journey and maybe pin a few things onto that so that can be really appreciated. Sure. Well, I do actually model the book on one of these stories of female initiation where there's a descent and a return. And there's so much that you lose in motherhood, either in new motherhood or as you're mothering. You lose control, you lose freedom, you sometimes lose a sense of yourself. And then you're you're kind of down there in the underworld, you're in the inmost cave, and there often what we meet when we're mothers is we meet our own shadows. You know, there's this um, Faye Weldon quote that I love. Uh, It's something like, um, the best thing about not having children is that you can go on thinking that you're a good person. (laughs) Your maternal balrogs. (laughs) That's right. That's right. You're going to meet yourself in your ugliest form. Um, But if you can tolerate that and survive it, you will return with gifts. And I talk in the book about the gift of mature spirituality, of renewed creativity, and of inner authority. Mm -hmm. It's coming out in spring 2021. (laughs) (laughs) And we will absolutely announce that many times on the show. Oh, you better believe it. I'm just left with, there is so much to say about it. And I'm yeah. struck with how vitalizing it's been for us to move around this uh, the cultural uh, references and movies and that it's everywhere. But I wonder if it's time for us to go on the heroic journey of analyzing a dream. I think so. Hi, this is Joseph from this Jungian Life podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. 
Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Well, our dreamer today is a woman who is uh, 33 years old, and she is a movement teacher and a therapist. And here's the dream. The dream consisted of three segments. In the first, I was outdoors looking up, observing a group of men. They were engaged in some project involving large structural pieces of architecture, e.g. old stone walls. One item was made of clay and included a large carving. I think it was of a face. The men had made a mistake in handling the clay so that it appeared to have become moldy. White spots had appeared on it. I thought or heard a voice saying something like, they didn't appreciate that the clay is alive. It breathes. It absorbs and retains moisture. The men were trying to remedy the situation. They poured red wine on the clay as if that would destroy the mold. In the second part of the dream, I was indoors with other women in a small, bright jewelry shop or workshop. A young woman had brought a tiny, delicate watch that had broken. She also brought wonderful, intricate drawings of the watch and the repairs needed. With another woman, I began planning the repair. I was confident we could re- pair it, but my companion was fretful, fearing that we wouldn't be able to. Her worries didn't seem to interfere with my confidence. I continued to explain two possible ways we could repair the watch. In the third part of the dream, I was nearly cl- I was neither clearly indoors nor outdoors, but in a large bright space, seemingly boundless, maybe like a marquee or gazebo outdoors. A woman had given me a task. I was to write, beautifully, the list of guest names for a wedding. A man was nearby. I think he was somehow involved, too. He was a little effeminate. I was left pretty much alone, and the paper with the names was crumpled and stained. For context, she tells us that at age 16, She knew that art college was right for her, but her parents would not allow her to apply. And for the last 15 years, she spent developing other parts of herself, chiefly caring, supportive, advisory roles. She feels this has been, at least in part, a compensatory and protective journey. But she still feels angry and hurt that she was prevented from pursuing her creative life when she knew that it was the right thing for her. Uh, She says she's about to embark on training as a psychotherapist and that relationships within her family continue to be strained. Uh, She is single. The main feelings in the dream, she reports, as at first being deflated and embittered, that in the first segment only men seemed involved in the task and that she, as a woman, seemed unable to participate, or at least no one was inviting me to help. She was irritated and grieved that the men had failed to recognize the particular qualities of the clay, so it had become damaged, perhaps irreversibly. In the second segment, she was confident that she could fix the watch, but nervous that as a woman, she seemed relegated to small indoor tasks, unlike the men in the first dream segment. And in the third segment, she was panicking that she couldn't write the list as beautifully as she should, and she was convinced that fresh, beautiful new paper must be available, but she was unsure of how to procure it. So this reminds me of the hero's journey with three different stages here. 
Yeah, it's really such a striking dream. Whenever I come across a dream that has kind of three parts, or maybe some dreams have two parts, some dreams have four parts, but three is not an uncommon number. Um, it's always uh, it seems important to me to understand the way that they are related, the parts. I often think about it like a triptych, like a painting with three parts. There are three parts for a reason, and they they inform each other. And oftentimes it's almost like a theme and variation where there's one image that shows up in one dream. A very similar theme is maybe dealt with very differently in another section. In this dream in particular, the arc of it, I notice, feels like there's the first part where she's not involved, she's only watching, and there's been this spoiling that has happened there's an, a kind of optimism in the second part where she's like, I can do this, I can fix it. And then the optimism kind of falls off again in the third part. There's a kind of panic that she won't be able to do it correctly. So I'm just noticing that energy throughout these three segments. What I'm picking up in these three parts is the theme of agency. What can uh, the dream ego do? Uh, she's sort of on the periphery in the first part with this, uh, the carving that the men in her dream may have have ruined, uh, may not have taken sufficient care. The second part, she's pretty confident that she can repair it, but she has a shadow, another woman, uh, who is fretful and carries the part of her that isn't sure she can uh, fix the watch. And in the third part, uh, she has a, she has a task. It appears that she is not going to be able to complete the task. You know, I want to say that all of these tasks are not hers. Even in the second scene where she's repairing the watch, she's confident she can fix it, but she also feels like she's been relegated to small indoor tasks. So there's a sense that, yeah, I can do this, but it's too small for me. I'm going to jump to an overarching uh, in interpretation here and then maybe say a little bit about why I think so. I wonder about her decision to train as a psychotherapist because it seems like she's wanted the creative life. She's known that was right. Uh, psychotherapy can be a wonderful career. Obviously, I think so. But it, it isn't good if you were groomed to be the helper and the carer in your family, and you're coming to it because you're good at it, because you were always forced into that role. And I hear, you know, that this, this clay is alive. And of course, there's, this, there's the metaphor of human flesh being clay. Something wants to come into being here. But clay is also an art supply, and this is a carving and it, you know, it's been carved in clay, so it, it is an artistic project, and it hasn't been well tended, and it needs to have this kind of lifeblood of red wine poured over it, hopefully to mend it. It's not really clear if it will work or not. Then she's doing this other task that feels too small for her, this tiny, delicate watch. It's beautiful, um, but it, it feels it's not her task, and it, and it feels too small. She can do it. She's confident she can do it, but I'm not sure it's what she really wants to be doing. And then finally, there's this idea of a wedding, which of course is very archetypal. It's this image of a conjunctio. I always perk up when I hear that there's a wedding in a dream. But her role is very ancillary. She's writing the names down and she's supposed to write them beautifully, which again is kind of a, a fine detail-oriented task, mm -hmm. kind of a... Um, Calligraphy. Yeah, it's not a center stage kind of role. And she's feeling panicked that she won't be able to do it right. So I wonder a little bit if she has chosen a life that is too small for her in some ways. I am picking up too on your comment, Lisa, that uh, none of these are tasks that the dream ego herself selected. That she's observing this group of men. It's somebody else's watch that uh, someone brings in to be repaired. And then finally, she's assigned the task of um, doing the calligraphy for, I guess, the wedding invitations. So, so I think I'm uh, kind of 
going to underline your your point about is this next stage of her life of training as a psychotherapist, her deep creative potential here? Is it coming from her own wellspring? Uh, she says in her context that she spent 15 years developing other parts of herself, caring, supportive, and advisory roles. And um, I wonder if psychotherapy is an extension of that kind of service rather than uh, her own creative energy. I'd, of course, we don't know. But that's where the dream takes me. And especially with the affect and the dream of, uh, you know, her strained relationships with, with family and these tasks in this dream, you know, none of which are truly f- fulfilling. There is a feeling that she's in a conundrum inside of herself. Taking what you've all said inside, I am. Um, feeling that it might be a relief to the dreamer to remind herself to look symbolically at the dream. That it feels like there are certain elements of her own psyche that are being marginalized because of a literal attitude. So, for instance, when she says, you know, it's deflating and embittering to see that only men are involved in the first task— Well, one can indulge that attitude when you think those men are not you. Right, yes. (laughs) So it might actually be very empowering to for her to imagine that although this is pictured as a man, it represents an energy that is not specifically gendered. And it could represent her own muscular attitude, her own capacity for... Um, heavy lifting, so to speak. Joseph, that is such a good point. When I want to just jump in and say that sometimes we do this, we we sort of um, take this kind of attitude toward an image in a dream when we feel disallowed from identifying with that part of ourselves. Yeah, perfect. In Jung's terms, it would be that the animus, which is a creative power in a woman, has been enshrouded in a masculine complex. So if the animus reminds a woman of particular male figures that she has found very unappealing or stultifying or obstructing in her life, and conversely, this can happen for a man, that his anima uh, becomes over-identified with lived experiences of women who've been unsupportive, then that inner figure can take on a negative quality that it intrinsically does not need to have. But one may have to go through an alchemical journey of purging that active energy in her of these negative associations, which really belong in the outside world. That her ability to work collaboratively with her own dynamism and to work the clay is all of hers. It doesn't. It yeah. doesn't belong to anyone else right. but her. I think she's been taught that it doesn't belong to her. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah. And when I think of her thwarted efforts to be an artist, uh, in her associations, that uh, to sculpt clay is in one of the realms of art. Mm-hmm. And even though if it's moldy, meaning that it's been unattended to, left alone, mm-hmm. maybe exposed to conditions that are not ideal which could represent her own capacity to be a sculptor or to work in those mediums, somewhere there's a response to that. Mm-hmm. And while the red wine might be, might be literalized again as some kind of disinfectant, I would put that aside and think of the red wine as symbolic and in some way anointing. But to add wine to the clay, the red bloodness of wine could be inviting another kind of generative spirit or even sanctification of the clay that is her clay that she has a right to tend mm-hmm, to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's lovely. The other part of the dream where her inner engineer seems to have be waking up, you know, she has this intricate engineering drawing of the, the watch and she may not think of herself as an engineer, but clearly 
the woman that brings in this detailed engineering description of the watch understands how things work, how things break, and how things can be repaired, which is a metaphor also for her, her psyche, that what she feels is not working for her. There's a part of her that has a plan about that, and it's reminding her that this is all repairable. This isn't catastrophic. This isn't like a hurricane wiping through your psyche. This is take a cog out, put a cog in, put a screw in, wind it up. Let's get back to work. Time is a wasting, Mm -hmm, by the way. mm -hmm. And there's some clay over there that's waiting for you to take hold of it. So while the ego may feel diminished and pushed back around it, there's a lot of positive potential in all of this. I am uh, lifting up a a point that you've both made about the men, uh, you in particular, Joseph. Uh, We have the men at the beginning who have made a mistake in handling the clay. And as an inner image, that is her inner masculine. Of these, And it's an image of her relationship to her own inner masculine, where she perceives them as basically uh, careless, not caring for the clay, and, and what you just related about the wine. And then there's another man who appears at the end at the wedding, and she says that a man was nearby, that he was somehow involved, and uh, he was a little effeminate. So here is another image of her inner masculine that is passive and just standing by, and the dream ego perceives him as uh, ineffective, you know, and not uh, participating, not good for much. So these are interesting images of her own inner masculine, her own assertiveness, capability, agency, and ability to get something done, get get their hands on it. In the first case, the men get their hands on it, and, and she thinks it's ruined. In the second case, he just doesn't do anything at all. So I think that would be an interesting thing to you know, for the streamer to reflect on is, um, what about those parts of me? It's a really eloquent dream, isn't it? And it's very rich. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.